good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for staying here. Thank you very much, Mr. Tom, for inviting me to this talk and for the opportunity of uh, talking about uh, ethics and law and other scams that engineers usually don't talk about. Um, the short story of this presentation is that during the last year, I've been involved in a company with which I collaborate, which is the Georgia, in the GDPR compliance procedure for the company. <coughs> I've been one of the people in the company talking to lawyers and staff to define the compliance process for the company. And in the process of doing this, I learned a bit, quite a bit about the uh, GDPR and other uh, regulations uh, related to uh, privacy for data. Uh, and uh, for some time, I have been thinking about how that would apply to research. Research has, as we are going to see in a moment, uh, some exceptions in the law, but still, there are a lot of things that we should take into account when we are doing the staff with uh, personal data. So the presentation is about that. So thanks again for the opportunity, because for me it's, it was like putting into practice what I have learned from the company now in the context of uh, Research. So, first of all, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer, and I don't have any formal training or law, and this is not legal advice and all of that that you need to know before starting. So, consider this as the educated opinion of an, of an engineer after talking to lawyers, after reading the law, and after reading other people talking about this uh, for research. Which means probably everything is wrong. Well. Okay, first of all, should we worry? I mean, we are researchers. We are doing for the, you know, for the benefit of the public. We are doing our research. Uh, so, what about these laws? Do they affect to us? Well, the short answer is yes, they do. When we are doing stuff like mining software repositories, I'm going to focus on this. Of course, software engineering have many other things. I'm not going. I'm not going to talk, for instance, when you uh, survive people or when you uh, deal with people behaviors with tools and stuff like that. But you can think that those cases are even more related to privacy than the <coughs> that I'm going to talk about. So consider this as the bare minimum that you need to do. You are doing that all kind of stuff that may include, for instance, personal opinions on matters. Uh, identification of individuals is much more important and should be avoided much more than the kind of things that we are going to do over here. Uh, first of all, you know the environment. So usually we work with information in software repositories. First, I want to say, well, that, that's technical, but you know there is a lot of personal information in there. It's basically the history of all the people working in those repositories. If you analyze that information, you can learn a lot about those developers. You can know when they get vacation. You can know when they are working in this or this project. You can know when they are switching companies. You can know even when they have a spare time, or what they are doing in their spare time, that maybe the employer doesn't like it now. Or any other uh, uh, things that is um, personal to them. And you have personal identifiers, identifiers that can link all these to real persons. So that's why uh, when we are working with software development repositories, even if the information that we are working with is public in the sense that anyone can collect it, uh, still we are dealing with this kind of information. So we're going to do an analysis from two different points of view. One is the legal, and the other one is the, the, the ethical. Um, in fact, both are quite interrelated. When you look at the guidelines for applying GDPR in research, for instance, the one from the Commission itself, that I'm going to, to cite a lot, uh, at the very beginning they say the law says something, but we encourage you as funders of research to also have into account the ethical details that maybe are not forbidden by law, but just should be avoided. So that's why. Uh, the presentation is not going to be poor from the law point of view. I mean, some of the things that I'm going to do, maybe you are not strictly required by law to do, to do that, but the ethics of the GDPR and the founders, like the European Commission and many, and many of the member states that are pushing for it, basically means that you should have that into account. So, first of all, uh, uh, well, uh, by the way, if you go to the web page of the, this seminar, there is a link to the slides. That is maybe interesting to you because these are links. So everything in, uh, in gold is a link so that you can click and download the actual document. So this is one of the documents I'm going to uh, cite much, uh, more during the presentation. It is a recommendation by the European Commission 
if you are going to apply for 18 to 25. And they detail everything you should be doing with related, related to their privacy and so on. And in those words, they talk about uh, we are, as a founder of research, interested not only in you complying with the law, but also you having ethics and trying to respect the privacy of the workers, of everybody that is involved in the law. That's why, not only from the personal point of view, because maybe you are interested in ethics, but also because Joe Thunder is very likely interested in ethics, you should have everything into account. And my impression is that this is going to be more and more important with time. It's going to be important in the proposals that we write, it's going to be important in the papers we publish, and it's going to be important in the reviews of the projects that we do. Uh, a summary of the applicable law. The situation in Europe changed a bit um, one year ago when the, the GDPR, well, at the beginning of this year, when the GDPR started to, to be in practice. The GDPR is um, a law from 2016, so it's been uh, like three years. But it started to be um, enforced this year, and uh, that, that's probably one of the more advanced laws in the world right now with respect to respecting privacy of persons. In fact, there is a lot of discussion to whether it's um, too much law uh, with respect to privacy. And some of the countries, like the United States, for now at least, are not uh, uh, enforcing some that's such kind of, uh, of, um, of law. But one specific aspect of the GDPR may, makes it very important, which, which is GDPR is applied to any uh, to anybody in Europe, I mean in the European Union, but also to the rights of any European citizen or any European uh, resident. Which means, if your data happens to be traded in the States by a United States company, that company could be sued in Europe because of that. And that's one of the reasons why everybody is so worried about GDPR in the commercial uh, world. Uh, but there are other similar regulations. So for instance, in Europe, many nations, many countries have similar regulations to the GDPR. In some cases, they predate the GDPR. And in some other parts of the world, that's starting to happen. So for instance, California has uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which has a lot of the same aspects that the GDPR has. In any case, I'm going to focus on the, on the GDPR during the presentation. So to which extent is research a step? Uh, in research, basically, we are going to do two main things with data. One is processing the data, and the other one is publishing the results or the data itself. In short, processing has no problem. We need to be careful with some things, but basically you can process the data as always. Uh, the main problem is with publication. And if you look at it from the uh, privacy point of view, it makes a lot of sense. Because whatever you process, in the end, it's something for you. And we are researchers, so basically it has no effect on the real person. So if we are, if we are companies taking decisions on consumers, for instance, that would be quite different. But being researchers, usually the results, I mean, our processing doesn't have a direct impact on persons. Still, there are some things that we need to be careful with. I will be talking about those later on. But publication is completely different. Why do we want to publish it? Because, uh, to publish? because uh, we want to publish the results, of course, but we also want to publish data sets for reproduction and for sharing with others. And that's where the main problem is. Because that those data sets, or even in some cases those results, include personal information. So a very simple example is when you're writing a paper, and you want to uh, explain a very specific case that you found in your data. Uh, up to now, you can read a lot of papers where they say this developer and the name of the developer was doing this and this that day of January last year, and I found out that that's interesting because of this or this reason. In that case, basically, you are exposing activities of that person. And while the activities are public, because they are published in, in a repository, still, that person has the right of you not highlighting those uh, activities in a, in a paper in that way. But that's only the simple, the, the most simple case. The usual case for ads is when we share data sets. Those data sets may include a lot of information, of course, can in many cases for public uh, records, but still having a lot of high level of uh, information. So, for instance, you can do things like profiling all the people in our repository, uh, uh, trying to link them to a company. And then you have 
all the commits in the repository, link it to the company and to a person. Which means that you can now, just by using your data, who is employed by which company. And that's something that is, to some extent at least, uh, protected by this kind of uh, ethics. So that's the kind of things that we need to figure out how to do. Uh, so as I said, processing, according to the law, needs to be lawful, fair, and transparent. Uh, if you look at the three different aspects, lawful it is, because it fulfills <laughs> one of these three conditions. There are many conditions in the law that says if, if they comply with this, it's lawful. And uh, we usually can use some of these. The first one is very rare in our case, because we usually don't have the explicit consent of the data subjects, of the persons in the data. Because they, for instance, are uploading the data to GitHub, and they are not telling us, I give you permission for doing using this for research. In some cases, we do, because we do a specific research with persons, and we interview them, for instance, and in that case, we should be asking for a specific consent to them. We are going to use your data for this project, and for this, and this, and that, all of that. But that's not usually the case. Fortunately, there are two other cases that we usually comply with. In the case of our public institutions, like universities, for instance, usually we can say this is a task in the public interest. Because research is in the charter of the university, and the, and the charter of the university is an official and um, <coughs> basically is supported by the parliament or whatever, depending on the country. Which basically means that institution is intended for doing research. So doing research is for them awful and, and they should be doing this. And that's it. The other one is mostly applied for private institutions. And it's legitimate interest. Which is quite similar, but a bit different. In the sense that you don't need uh, something like uh, an approval by a government or by, a, by an administration body or something like that. It's, it's good enough to show that that's something that is in, um, in, your, uh, in, in your benefit, but it's basically, um, let's say, something not harming third parties, in this case, the data subjects. Uh, since most of us are working for public institutions, usually that's the case that we can use. This is important if we have to talk to lawyers, because basically, when we prepare the documents stating how we are collecting the data, etc., etc., we need to say what we are going to, to be in this uh, reality. And the other part was being fair and transparent. And that's where most of the staff uh, is. Uh, that means that we need to be careful of how we do the processing and of course the publishing, but in this case the processing. We should uh, put in place adequate safeguards to ensure that data from persons, the rights and freedoms of persons, are not harmed by our effect. Uh, but we can do it. The only thing is we need to be careful and very likely we are going to be requested to document what we are doing, what, what, what are these safeguards are. And we have to do some things that I'm going to talk later, like uh, being sure that I'm not exposing personal identities uh, without the need, being sure that I'm storing the data correctly so that it's not going to be leaked some uh, ACD or somebody is going to steal it, to steal it or whatever. So uh, this is from the text of the GDPR and says with some detail, of course this is uh, let's say law English, which is in some cases not, not easy to follow. But, but you can see that there are some, uh, let's say, some, some description of the kind of self words that we need to put into place. Uh, they mention things like single anonymization of data, which is some of the techniques that we are going to need to, to use. And uh, basically, they say that we need to make it very difficult the identification of the data set. They are such as other persons involved in the data. With respect to publication, staff is more complicated. Because, in principle, the, the, the law says, I mean, the GDPR says that sharing personal data should be doing through a process which is managed, I mean, somebody is in care of it, and uh, has access controls in staff. That basically means that you cannot just put the data on the net. On the contrary, when we are writing the production packages, for instance, we want just to put the data on the net as much as possible. We need to find a middle ground. For instance, we can try to find out which part of the data 
has no personal information and put that straight on the net. And then maybe have another data that we are only going to share under certain conditions. So for instance, with researchers that sign the document saying I'm going to use this in that and that conditions. Both together usually can do much more than, than one of them alone. And maybe for reproducing the full paper, you need both together. But maybe with one of them, you can also do something. So <coughs> That, that's the kind of techniques, when I was talking uh, a moment ago about safeguards, that's the kind of techniques that, go, that are going to be our safeguards when doing all of, all of this. Uh, from my point of view, the main problem is here. How to do this in a way that we can still do reproducible, reproducible research and we can also share data with all our researchers. Uh, well, this is from a um, uh, document on ethics. Uh, or, uh, I mean, the same document that I was going to do before, and talks a bit about uh, civil anonymization and anonymization. And basically says the technique that we are using is not important. The important is how easy it is to de anonymize. I mean, to recover the personal identities of the people. And it's important to realize that even if you think that we are anonymizing the data, because there is no personal information in any way, maybe you can still recover the original personal identities. Depending on what you and I'm going to talk about an example of that later. So, if this is just to, to say the technique you are using is not important. What you should be trying to do is to make sure that the animation the data is quite different, meaning reverting the process is quite different. Um, uh, uh, this document on ethics and, uh, and data processing has a table uh, with um, signals that we are having a higher risk with respect to data protection. And they have several categories I'm reading because maybe you cannot see it from the point of view. Types of personal data, and say it's rational or ethnic origin, political opinion, kinetic, blah, 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 sex life, great union members. Then say it's data subjects, children, vulnerable people, people who have not given explicit consent. The scale or complexity of data processing, large scale, systematic monitoring, uh, involve multiple data sets, etc. etc. Data collection techniques, privacy invasive methods, using camera system, data mining, profiling individuals, using artificial intelligence, using automatic decision making, and the involvement of non European countries, transfer to or from non European Union countries. How many of those cases do you think that are usual in our research? Lots of them. Lots of them. So this is my analysis. Red means usually we do that, and uh, yellow means very likely we are doing that. So for instance, do you think that we are using data from children? Depends on what you study, I mean. Exactly. I mean, I'm sorry, I studied but, but imagine, so no, But yes. imagine, you are studying GitHub. Are you using data from children? Very likely. The data of my child is in GitHub, for instance. Maybe you don't know, but that doesn't matter. The problem is that you are using the other children. And, and it's, it's unlikely, depending on what you are doing, but maybe you are just analyzing, I don't know, NPM repositories. And it happens that some three years, all the uh, uh, child has a repository of those. Then you are analyzing the other children. So just as one example to show that we need to reflect <coughs> on what we are doing essentially, because in some cases, we are focused on our research and nothing else. And that's usual, and we are researchers, and that's the reason. But what we are doing has some, some, some impact on that. So this is a more detailed uh, analysis. I'm not going to go through all of it. So, but you have the slide, so you can go later if you want, of the different areas. So for instance, children and vulnerable people, maybe we don't know, but very likely we have both categories of people in our data. Uh, they are subject to special protection. There are several articles in the law because uh, those subjects are very special and they need a special protection and there are very special safeguards that we need. And uh, the fact that we don't know that they are in our data set is not an excuse, which means things are complex. So how do we know that if in a listing of persons in GitHub, we have persons with less than 13 year old, for instance? Just a second. How sure. does uh, GDPR define the notion of a child? Depends on the countries. I, I, I don't know all the details, but I don't know that usually less than 16. Um, and there is some special protection if it is less than 14 or 13, I don't remember now. But that can be changed by the, by the member states too. Because 
how data sources are usually American, right? So they okay. use credit of 13. So in a way, you are kind of safe. Theoretical. Theoretical. Theoretically speaking, you are safe for those who are lower than 13 are not but, there. But, but remember, you know, that, that, remember that that's not that, that, that's a matter to match. Because the fact that minors, I mean, uh, children should not be there, doesn't mean that if they are there, they should be protected. And uh, that's why th this is quite different from other provisions where basically if they cheated me and they were under 15, that's not a problem. Not here, that's a problem. And, uh, and probably that's impossible to, to, to provide a solution for this because you never know. You, you have 1,000 names and you don't know which ones are for children. Mm -hmm. But still. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think my, my impression is this situation is really, really difficult to deal with. You cannot go and uh, check all the persons to know none of them is a tool. Which basically means maybe we need to treat all the data as if they were children, for instance. Which doesn't make a lot that does make some sense. Let's talk about that later. And and has to do with the spirit of the of the law. Yeah, please. What should have provided uh, uh, wrong age? Are we still responsible? Uh, so, uh, what, sorry? If, if a, a child, for instance, is 20, uh, let's yes. say, are we still responsible? No, but that's the case that he was. Maybe, maybe yeah. the, the child is cheating you. Yeah. But still, he's a child and the data is here. Okay. But, again, but, but, but uh, remember, I'm not talking about responsibilities, whether you're going to go to jail or whatever. Let's say, from the legal point of view, Probably you can defend in a jury and you can say, no, this person was not supposed to be here, whatever, and maybe it has to have better safeguards, and maybe you're not going to have any problem from the legal point of view, strictly legal. From the ethical point of view, you know that maybe you have children there, and you know that some actions that you do with that data could have an impact on the children, and you have to be concerned about that. And if you are, for instance, asking for a proposal for the commission, you need to have that into account. So the same problem holds if we, uh, for instance, gather data from people outside the European Union, we're still supposed to check that all of them are outside of the UE. Like or we deal with the data as if yeah. some of them were out. Yeah. Like Facebook does. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to what extent can we, should we distrust our sources, our respondents, our participants? Because, of course, when I'm running surveys, the first thing I'm asking is consent. So I do have an explicit consent for dealing with their answers. But maybe somebody didn't really give their consent and just clicked on yes. Like, I mean, where is the boundary between uh, a 12-year-old person saying that they are 20 and the person uh, saying, clicking yes without actually for the person clicking yes, uh, there is a lot of uh, text in the editor saying that you should, what is informed consent? Yes. And basically that means it's not yet clicking yes at all. So you need to ensure that the people understand, blah, 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 and then that they click, and, and they may even click separately for different things. I like you to do this, but not this, for instance. So uh, I'm not a lawyer again, so I don't know which is the right set for now and this person is a children or not. But as you, would be saying later, uh, as you would be saying later, maybe it, it makes sense to just act as if, as if we have children, as if we have any of the different categories. Because maybe that's not relevant for the research. And if it, does, if it is not relevant for the research, I mean, to deal us, if everybody were children, why not do it then? Maybe you are not losing anything. And it's easier then than to check whether you have children or not in the data set. But that's something that we can discuss later I mean, in questions and answers, because I don't have an answer. And probably we need a, a lawyer, or maybe 10 lawyers, for now and about that. Because uh, that's something I have to say when, when in the cafe we've been talking to lawyers, every lawyer is an opinion. And most of this has not been uh, uh, tested in court up to now, because the regulation is uh, quite new. And uh, that means that even the advice that you get, well, you need to be careful with it. Because in the end, there's going to be a court deciding on the bottom. But again, remember, one thing is that this is lawful, and maybe it is. And the other one is, well, maybe you can go a step, a step further and just say it is ethical, and if I can avoid that, I avoid that. That's it. Okay, going through all of the others, 
So privacy invasive methods, they are defined in the, G in the GDPR too, but, but for instance, you can do things like who is working off hours. That can be a problem. So for instance, in Spain, that's unlawful. That means that you can find people doing unlawful stuff. Uh, you can also do things like uh, what are doing people doing vacation? Or is these people committing to repositories of their competence? All of those things could have some trouble for people. And uh, we can be very invasive when we are doing research. Because we can do a lot of things. And we, could, we can infer a lot of information that could be a problem for the person, for the specific person. Is that uh, uh, activities or whatever are easily linked to that person. And of course we can say, well, the information is there. Any employer can go and check, for instance. But the fact is that if we provide something like a list of these persons who are working for competitors, that's way different. And that's the kind of stuff that we need to do, uh, have into account. Um, the same is uh, for groups. So for instance, we can tag activities by newcomers, but then we can do that for specific numbers, for specific names of newcomers. And we can do a lot of things related to how they perform, or how they compare to others, or, or whatever. In many cases, we write papers or we conduct research using artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever, and that's <coughs> specific provisions. And at large scale, we try to be large scale as much as possible without another risk, which means that the better the research, the riskier. And the reason is, we have more data, it's more likely that we are dealing with data from protected persons, for instance. We are data mining from social media. So for the, defi the definition in the law, things like uh, GitHub is basically social media. You can think it's, it's just a professional repository. It's not. You have a lot of stuff there, including who likes whom, in the form of stars, for instance. So it's basically social media, and you are getting data from it. So that means that the kind of regulations that would apply are quite similar to the kind of regulations that would apply if you are mining Twitter or Facebook. And as I said, usually we don't have a specific, a specific agenda. The, 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 the most similar thing to this that we have is when people came to GitHub, for instance, they sign the uh, agreement with GitHub. And that agreement may say some things that maybe are useful for us, but not usually. And uh, specific consent, on the other hand, is quite precise. It no, it's not something like, well, maybe at some point I'm going to do research. No, it's saying that the, the individual, I'm going to do this and this research with this end, and your information is going to be used in this and this way, etc. And that's never done with those agreements with other companies, with other service providers. So, uh, can we avoid this case if we are mining data? I mean, if we are secondary, if, if you are using secondary data, probably not. So that's why. Usually we cannot use this as the reason for our research. We need to revert on the public interest case. And of course, transfer across the uh, 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 European Union borders is, is business as usual. We collaborate with researchers in any part of the world, and we use data from data providers which are in the States, or in some key in the States. Which means we are crossing borders all the time. So, I hope that at this point you have become a little worried. And you will think, well, maybe I should, I should be doing something. So, what should we do? First of all, we should be doing the daily analysis. So, this is the process that they describe for uh, preparing a grant uh, for the Commission, uh, so preparing a proposal for a grant for the European Commission for 2020. But the guidelines, in my opinion, are quite similar if you intended just to write any kind of paper or study or whatever. The idea is quite similar. So first of all is we should be doing a detailed analysis of what we are going to do. And try to find out the, the, the ethics issues raised. Things like uh, which ethics issues may be raised by the data collection or processing. Uh, how can we mitigate those issues? And mitigation is the word. We cannot avoid all the problems, but we can mitigate them. And we can mitigate them to the broad to the point that they are not meaningful compared to all the risks that people in space have in the data world. And remember that in the end, most of us are working with data which is public. So the person that put their announcement is public. So basically, we need to be at that level of risk, which is not that low. So that's 
why the kind of analysis is not the very worst. So it's the same things, but maybe quite simple. Like, if I don't need to publish names, don't publish names. If they don't contribute anything to the research, just avoid that. Remove them from the data set, for instance, if you don't need them. And that's it. So imagine, for instance, that you are analyzing GitHub repositories only to look at the source code. Then the only thing that you need to do is ignore things like names and commits. And then you the source code. And there is no personal information, there is nothing to hide, there is, that's it. So things like that may be quite simple in some kind of research. Maybe more difficult in some of them. So uh, the, the data analysis is mandatory right now for 2020, and it's going to be mandatory for uh, next rounds, and, and many member states are doing the same. Uh, usually, in our universities, there is a person uh, uh, who is a, a DPO, the Data Protection Officer, uh, basically who is responsible for that, and usually they have procedures, and this is becoming a standard. My university, for instance, is, is now de de developing the process. And basically they have, in, in social science and health science, they have a lot of things related to this already. And basically what they are doing is reducing that for other participants. And that means that usually have, they have procedures that may be a bit stupid at the very beginning because they are thinking for on the health uh, uh, studies. But you can adapt them to the things that you want to do. And maybe you need to run what they call a data protection impact assessment, which is a formal process within the institution trying to know the ethical and legal issues raised by your research. And again, people from social science and from health science are very used to these kind of things. Uh, probably this is a way that we need to enter to. The approach that the GDPR recommends is what they call data protection by design, which is from the very beginning, from the moment you are designing the research, have data protection in mind. Things like I said before, if you don't need such and such data which happens to be personal, but it's not relevant for your, your research, just ignore it. Strip the data from that, from the very beginning, so that you have no problem afterwards. If you think that you are going to be needing to publish some kind of personal information, think from the very beginning how you are going to deal with it. Maybe you don't need it for most of the process, maybe some, only some people need access to it. Maybe you are, cannot publish it uh, uh, to everyone, but maybe you can have that for specific researchers. Maybe you cannot share it with such and such partner because they are outside the European Union, whatever. Think on it from the very beginning. Uh, in the case of research, these guidelines are quite uh, specific about what thing, kind of things we can do. And this is just a summary. But we can do things like anonymizing and pseudo anonymizing. Minimizing the data that we are using. Minimizing the data means look at the data you are going to use and strip everything that you don't need, just in case. That way you are starting to avoid problems. Cryptography, things like hashing and encrypting, to ensure that only certain persons or only certain processes have access to the data that could be sensible. Uh, check data protection. Because uh, depending on how you are storing your data, you also can have trouble. For instance, you cannot store in the cloud, depending on whom is the cloud and the security uh, concerns of the service provider for the cloud. And ensure that you have procedures for exercising fundamental rights. And that means things like, if somebody doesn't want to be in the data set, they can ask for that, for instance. And there are some other provisions over there. Uh, yeah. Right, in this last part, the game is not always possible. Mm -hmm. Always, but again, classical example, anonymous server. Yeah. No way, right? They cannot identify the... Uh, well, for those of you who want to think about that, think of one case where clinically, this is going to be quite interesting. Imagine that somebody wants to be removed from a public Git repository. Remember that every commit in the Git repository is hashed including the identity of the person. Mm -hmm. That means you're writing the pool repository and losing all of the information in the repository. What would happen if, if somebody takes in this to count and says, I want to be removed? What's going to happen? That, that's going to be quite interesting. And that, that's from my point of view an extreme case where technically, basically Git is not thought for, for doing that kind of stuff. On the other hand, somebody could say, now I'm working for an employer and all the things that they need in that repository are a potential problem for me, 
I want that to be removed. Not the code itself, but my identity. That means, makes sense, at least makes some sense. And according to the law, it's very likely that that person is right, can, can ask for that. What do we do? Imagine that you are the manager of that kid to pursue. It's not that easy. Okay, then coming back to uh, the organization, <coughs> some, some general rules. Collect minimum personal data if you are actually collecting it. But if you are getting data from external repositories, from, from secondary data, just get the data that you need. Anonymize and set anonymize early in the process, except that you need the data for something. Store the data securely. And this is not obvious. What means securely? For instance, means that you have to, 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 to have into account how the caps are made. Because maybe your laptop is very secure, but then you are doing laptops, uh, backups in USB sticks that are around the tables. Or maybe you are doing backup in the cloud. Or maybe the sensitive data is in your mobile phone. And happens that your mobile phone automatically is doing backup in the cloud. And you didn't realize that. So it's not that easy to define that. And limit the access to the data, which of course is needed to how you are uh, storing the data securely. And I forgot, dispose the data when you no longer need. From the point of view of research, in many cases we want to keep the data forever. And there are provisions for us for doing that. But we need to be careful in the sense that if we keep the data, we also keep being res uh, responsible for the data. So uh, we should be keeping the data that we want to be responsible for, and nothing more. And that's, from, for me as a researcher, that's a, a bit strange because I always want to have as much that the data as possible because I never know when that data is going to be available in the future. Now maybe we uh, need to still think a bit more on that and say, well, I, I want the responsibility of keeping that data wrong, but maybe I prefer to remove it and that's it. But, but that, that's the balance that we need to think about now. Uh, when we're talking about mitigation, one of the main practices is anonymization. Remember, you have a name, for instance, and you just convert the name into hash. From this point on, I use the hash. That means I don't know the person who is. Let's assume for a moment that the hash works. And that means that probably you can do maybe all the research just with the hash. And you can search the data, the data set just with the hash. And that's good enough. That means that you don't need to care about protecting the individual names or email addresses. But this is not absolute. Uh, first of all, people could be denimacing the data. Maybe a hash is not good enough. Uh, maybe the problem is not with the data as you are it, it's the methodology and the findings that you are doing. Maybe they have been an impact on persons. And maybe the problem is the origin of the data. Maybe the origin of that data is not lawful and the persons involved are not interested in being in that data. But, but animation, uh, animation and organization <coughs> are two of the main techniques recommended by the law. So let's go now to some definitions to understand the rest. Because I want to show you an example which is a bit detailed and we need some of these uh, names to, 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 to this around. First of all is data processing. In short, data processing is to get some data and produce some data. Quite similar to the, let's say, engineering uh, uh, definition. Remember, uh, sorry, uh, uh, be careful because the definition in fact is quite ample and you can see it's, uh, things like collection, recording, organization, extracting, and service, all of that is processing. So basically anything you do with the data is data processing. Which means when the law talks about data processing, it's talking about all of that. Who is subject to the GDPR? We already commented. Basically there are two main works, the data controller and the data processor. Their controller is the person or an institution determining the purposes and the means of the processing in the context of the definition of processing that we just wrote. So the person or institution who decides what to do with the data. And the processor is the person who, do, who, who, uh, who uh, processes the data on behalf of the controller. Usually, most of the responsibilities are for the controller, because the controller is designing. But the processor should be aware of what it's doing and also not doing things that are ethical or, 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 or legally uh, not legal. Then we have the DPO. 
every institution related to data should have one, university should really have one, and it's basically an independent person, can be an employee, but should be independent from the point of view of this task, and is appointed by the controllers and the processors. In this case, the university can be controller, can be processor, can be both. Uh, this person should be involved in everything, which means that they should be involved in the design of the procedures that you are using in your research. Maybe it can be involved by writing some recommendations and then all the researches in the university follow. Or maybe they want to have person-to-person -person meetings, whatever. It's important because they are going to be responsible to. So that's why uh, they need to be involved. Usually they are, on the other hand, a good local contact point for defining this. So if your institution has a good data processor officer, probably is the best person to talk to just to have to know what to do with your uh, research. And then you have the data protection impact assessment, which is basically the document where you define the, the, the potential impact of the research you are doing with respect to data, uh, including, of course, the potential negative impacts. And uh, it's important, the potential negative. So coming back to the case of children, I don't know if I have children, but <coughs> if I have children, this would be the impact. So basically, you need to analyze all the potential uh, things. Again, most of this is like a template. Because basically it's like, uh, if I have children, these are the impacts. And then you need to take on whether you have children or not. Of course, it's not that, that simple, uh, simple as that. But it's not that complicated either. Uh, examples that are mentioned in this document are cases where you need a DTPI. For instance, a company systematically monitoring employees' activities, including monitoring, work, station, internet activity, etc. So that's quite similar to what we do when we analyze software repositories. If you analyze a data repository, for instance, you can monitor what everybody does in that repository. If you're analyzing all the different repositories, issue tracking, code review, etc., you can track with a lot of detail the activity of all the employees or, or, or of all the people working in those repositories. Another case, gathering public social media data for generating profiles. Well, again, if you are going to GitHub and you try to profile the developers, for instance, you are doing things quite similar to this. So these are just examples. But just a second. This is the vulnerability of the subject in the first scenario. This is the kind of things that... Uh, yeah, but it stems from the fact that they employees. Not that. necessarily. Not necessarily. Well, in the example, they are employees. But if you look here, basically the thing is you are doing systematic monitoring of persons and you are doing data concerning poorly related data science. And that doesn't, that's, it's, uh, so the fact that they are employees is only the example. No, no, the fact that they are employees makes them vulnerable. Because potential results of the monitoring can be used against them yeah, of by course. the company. Of course. So if I'm monitoring a project for GitHub, at least as long as I don't disclose those results of project figures of any kind, they, this, this does not make them persons involved vulnerable. So the systematic monitoring concern is still there, but I don't think it will be related to vulnerability. Exactly. I said that you try to publish the data. And that's why I said at the very beginning, processing usually is not a problem. Publishing is usually a problem. If you want to do that research and you want to publish the result of the research, very likely you, you want to provide to the publish. Imagine that you are doing profile and your research is about I want to profile who is working for a company and who is not. Mm -hmm. for <coughs> And uh, at some point you are going to write a paper and you, you want to provide the results. And including in the results, probably there is a data set saying, I analyzed these thousand of stories and I found these people who for companies, there is not. Mm -hmm. That information could be something mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, if you are a company doing that for your own employees, that's good. Yeah. But still. And remember, all of this is just a balance between uh, what you can do and the impact that that's going to have. Let's go to a, to a study to understand this thing about anonymity is uh, maybe not good enough for civil anonymity. So this is a very common problem, this to me. So you have a collection of uh, commits with some properties for some repository. You go to GitHub and collect all of those commits. It can be a million commits, whatever. You analyze, for instance, something quite simple, number of committers per time. For any reason, that's important for your research. How can you publish the data set in your production plan? That's, that's the question. What can you publish exactly and how can you publish? For instance, can you publish the exact list of commits that you analyzed as such? The million commits with all the information you retrieved from the commits? What do you think? Personally, I don't have information. So no. Yeah. 
First of all, let's assume that we have a lawful basis. We, we assume already that we have. And uh, now this is Kimit. Well, this is a part of the of the meta data for a Kimit. Which part of that is protected by the repair? It's yeah. obvious. Which part is it? Yeah, the author name and the email address both uh, is. The message itself is not. Because the message itself. Well, what I mean is that it could be like the, the comment message could be uh, a reaction to comments by an animal. Of course. Of course. Message. But only if it is linked to the name. Yeah. But, but, but you are right from another point of view that we are going to talk later. But for now, let's consider the. The only thing that is really protected is this line here. Because it's the only one with has personal information. Okay. It's personal data and there is a definition for personal data. I'm not going to enter into the definition. But the definition on the other hand is very broad. For instance, an IP address is a personal data. Or uh, the email of a mobile phone, you know that every mobile phone has a single identifier, that's also personal data. An email address, of course, is a personal data. And of course, a name is personal data. <coughs> So yeah, that's what you say, the IP address for instance, because via the IP address you can't try to identify a person. So everything that links you directly to a person is considered personal data. So this is what we should be protecting or caring of. First of all, our data is public data, so we would say, as in Mara, I'm, I'm getting that commit from GitHub, the community is in GitHub, I'm just doing the same thing that GitHub is doing. For this, you have a specific provision. So the, the, the document here explains the case that they call open source data. The name is horrible. That's not open source data or, or nothing like that. But, but still, the idea that they try to capture is public data. And uh, they say very clearly the fact that some data are publicly available does not mean that there are no limits to the use. And they, they elaborate on that. I'm not going to enter into the debate. But basically, what they say is. Maybe the data is public, but the processing that you are doing still needs to do as much as possible to comply with it. And that means try to avoid identities and all of that, even if the original data can be get from the internet. And the, 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 the basic idea is simple. Maybe the data is there, but maybe nobody knows it. And what you are going to do is basically to signal specific persons. And of course the data that you use is public, but until, until you signal them, that signal is not evident. So for instance, maybe you provided them and find out that those persons work for a company. And maybe the data from anybody can do that if they have the right technique, but nobody did that to do that. If you publish that data, you are doing something new, even when the original data is public. That's the reason that you can buy it or not, but that's, a, that's a the reason. So there are more provisions about open source data, which basically means you still need to act. You cannot just say this is public and then do anything at all. So how to fix the problem? First idea is let's anonymize. Let's strip all personal data. But here we have a problem. If we strip all personal data, would mean we strip this line from the commit. Right? But remember, we wanted to count commits, committers per month. If I meet that line, I cannot count commuters because I know I cannot tell one commuter the commuter for all commit for the commuter for all. Right? Yeah, but uh, yeah. you could just change your name for like subject one for example and that name for subject one. Exactly. That's that's the second idea. Very good. So that's the second idea. We can say the anonymize the data. Anonymize is basically removing personal data. Say the anonymize is trying to, to, to write the data in a way that the identities are not easy to get. Uh, something which is important is if we do only that for research purposes, we are doing something which is bad for the research. As at least a lady in this room now, and, and, and many others. Because basically what we are doing is we are removing the possibility of identifying the same person with different identities. And that's important because that means that even a very simple thing like just hashing the uh, identity, for instance, means that from the research point of view, there are some things that we cannot do anymore. And th that's important because maybe we want to do exactly that because our paper is about how, how important are different identities for developers. 
Uh, think about that because we, we are going to come back to that later. But let's assume that we want just to count commits and not committers, and we can remove uh, just hands the blind. And then uh, there is a definition for this and all of that from the legal point of view. Don't worry too much. But basically, what it says is that you can do anything that you want from hashing to coding as, as long as the information you publish doesn't allow you to de de anonymize the people, to, to know again who they are. So, do you think this kind of pseudo anonymization is good enough? So, I assume that you know uh, SHA256, which is one of the best hashes algorithms that we have now. And then you get the identity, for instance, the email address, and you produce this. And you change the commit for this. Right? Is that good enough? No, because you can always go to the commits and to see in this commit, uh, yeah. this person was identified and then we know what this is. Exactly. Actually. Let's assume for a moment, because you are, you are advancing through your slides. Sorry. <laughs> but that, that's good. Let's forget about the move for, for a moment for this. Yes, with respect to strictly the email address, is this good enough? I mean, if you get that data, you are, it's completely impossible to retrieve the original email address. This was funny, because I was looking at the internet. There are companies providing you the service of, you send them a hash of an email address in several formats, which are usual, and they provide you not only the email address, but all the related information that they have for that address. <laughs> and uh, and it's like uh, for um, it's like uh, well there is a very interesting uh, uh, blog post which is this one which explains the techniques and the companies involved and um, and even the price and um, basically four tenths is the price for doing this kind of stuff. But this company is not respecting GDPR. Yeah, of course. But they are not. They are they are limited. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think you can you can uh, sue them in Europe, but maybe maybe not here. I guess they search through collected data. Sorry? I guess the trick is to search through collected data. That's let, 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 let's, let's move on and then we can come back to that. Uh, in, in any cases, pseudonymizing is not as powerful as we may think. Hashing is very quick, which means you don't really read really a company. You only need the list of email addresses. Uh, it is estimated that there are like uh, 5 billion email addresses in the world. Well, last year. Uh, of course, you can say, well, but who has those addresses? There are a lot of sources for addresses. We did the, the blog post. Data leaks, public information, stuff. There are companies, again, uh, devoted to collect all of that data. You can buy it, or you can collect it yourself. The thing is that even with a very modest machine, you can ask all the email addresses in a, in a fraction of, uh, well, in a very reasonable time. <coughs> so, again, it's not important. This is just to show that something that, in principle, you would think, oh, this is quite good. In fact, it's not that good. But of course, there are more problems. We can do something which is simple and maybe go in the direction to say, which is, well, don't, don't just hash, do something else. For instance, I can uh, uh, hash with, the, with uh, the uh, name, or I can add some subject, or I can use some has, uh, non hash functions, like uh, coding, or I can do encryption, or I can do many other things. And I could be saying, well, now I'm safe. And you are not, because of the problem that Tom was saying. So imagine that you are using encryption of coding, and you, if you are encrypting, you are keeping the key prevail. If you are coding, the coding table is prevail, so there is no way of reversing that. Is it good, good enough? Well, it is not. It would be something like this, where you have, imagine that you are using coding with a hidden coding table, and that means that for this person we select that number. And the problem is you go with the hash to GitHub, you put the hash in the GitHub search box, and you have the commit, and you have my face. And of course my data and everything. Which means that in this specific data set, even hiding completely the identity is not good enough, because there is some other data related to the person which is good enough for identifying the person. And remember that you don't need to <coughs> do this for the one million commits that you have in your data set. You only need to do that for the different identities, for the different coding numbers that you have. Which means that probably in, a, in, a, in some minutes you have everybody de-anonymized and you have the original data set with the identities. Which again means that 
the analysis that you need to do is a bit more careful than saying, I'm happy, I'm happy with that. You need to do a bit more of that. And um, you can do that from many different data sources. Just for curious, this is the, the, the way of doing that with software heritage, where they maintain uh, all the GitHub repositories that they find and, and, and all the source code that they find, because you can say maybe the subject is not in GitHub, it's very likely that the subject is going to be in software heritage, and basically you can do the same trick. <coughs> what can you do? You can anonymize the hash too, and you can code, for instance, the hash and do the same. But still, you have a comment, as somebody said. And with the comment, you can also go to GitHub, and you can also write the comment. Sorry, this is uh, this is wrong. If you write the comment, you get the commit too. You can you can try it because this specific comment is not that common, and the GitHub is going to find it as the first uh, Which means again, my trace is there. I didn't uh, uh, I didn't anonymize, and so on. So basically, uh, the, the the problem is tricky. And in the end, maybe you need to basically anonymize many different fields. And uh, some things are not obvious at the very beginning. So in this specific case, what can you do? Maybe you can um, try to do something like this, which basically is coding everything, and then have separate coding tables for everything, and then publish the data, have a separate coding table, that you are going to give only for researchers that sign your documents saying I'm going to respect the privacy, etc. Et Is that good enough for research? But just a second, even if you publish something completely innocuous, like, uh, I don't know, the number of um, committers or the number of uh, project purpose within a certain amount of time, somebody can essentially repeat your process because you also you are a nice person so you not only share data you also share scripts yeah. so i can equally well run yeah. those scripts and then i can know aha in this particular period of time i had i don't know 10 contributors maybe if you don't feel, if you don't even tell me which period of time yeah. i can even trace it back so by reproducing your research i can figure out who's who exactly and that's why at the very beginning i said when they recommend the kind of analysis that you need to do you need to do the analysis of what you are doing and what you could do with the data that you are releasing, including the scripts, including data sets, including everything. And in the end, it is a matter of risks. And of course, you need to do something. You cannot get blocked and say, I cannot publish anything because of all of this. But you need to be concerned about the risks of what you are doing and try to take your measures. And of course, getting a data directly from you is way different of getting a script that maybe can be run to get it. And maybe you can find out that from the legal point of view, you can do both things. Because after talking to lawyers, they tell you, don't worry, you can do both things. But from the ethical point of view, you say, well, right, I, I don't want to expose the people in the data set, so I, I want to anonymize the data set. But I don't think that the risk for the script is good enough, so I'm going to publish the script as such. Or whatever other decision you may take. And remember, there is no an answer, not an answer, specifically from the ethics point of view. From the practical point of view, when you are asking for a grant, for instance, you need to explain that you are concerned with all of this, that you know all of these risks, and that your level is going to be here. I'm going to publish the scripts, keeping care of this and this and this, and I'm going to publish and anonymize data, anonymizing this in this way, and I'm pretty sure that this is going to be good enough because of this of these reasons. And that's it. And of course, you need to put a balance somewhere, and you need to decide between publishing nothing and publishing something, I need to be here. And I agree with you that there is no risk zero. In fact, just saying somebody did something may be a problem in some contexts. So, um, well, the fact that we may need to publish data which is not public is important because of what we said before. So, for instance, if you have several people with different identities, sorry, the same people with uh, different identities, Another researcher may be quite interested in that. And maybe you can share the data with them. Maybe you need to do that under, under, under the signing of, a, of an agreement or whatever, but you can do that. So that's why, in many cases, you don't need to think about the data that you are publishing as a monolithic thing. There can be several components. Each of the components allow in for doing different things. And when they are combining all of them together, they can, of course, do more than each of the products myself.
and maybe you can publish some of them, and maybe you decide some of the others and publish them, but I anonymize them, and maybe some others I'm not going to publish them even anonymized, but I'm going to give them the researchers if they ask. <coughs> and when I say things like, uh, if you have an agreement with the other, don't think necessarily in a real agreement. Maybe you are just confident on the other researcher, and maybe you just give it to them. Like we share papers, for instance, even when that's not that much little, you know, in many cases. So the, the, the thing is then, uh, especially when we're talking about the ethical point of view, is that according to your ethics, you thought about it and you find out the balance for you. And then there's law, of course, and, and law will be meeting the value. Well, my impression is that the DDPR is not designed for public data. Because from my point of view, a lot of the things that we were talking about doesn't make sense. So if I can, can be then in my city GitHub, why a researcher has to care about that? Because the, what I did is, is something that can tell everybody with anything of my data in GitHub or in any other repository. My impression is that the GDPR we thought was designed with things like Facebook in mind, where all the data is private except for Facebook that they have all the data. And that's why there are so many constraints and everything. Maybe we researchers at some point need to work with people writing law and try to explain them these kind of things. Or maybe they need to clarify us, because maybe the spirit of the law is already that we can do anything that we usually do. Because uh, until the courts start to say something, in fact we are going to be in a great territory that nobody explored before. And you don't know when a specific angry person can tell you, my data is in your data set, and I'm going to sue you university because of me. And that's something that could happen. And right now, my impression is that no lawyer is going to tell you for sure, don't worry, there is not going to be any problem. Usually what they say is, well, I think you are well covered. And that's it. And now, how oh, I need to prepare. So, I'm going to skip some of the details because of the timing. <coughs> I'm going to skip all the details because of the timing. Go, go, go and read them later if you want. And I'm going to go just very briefly to the layers part, which is here. So I also think then, uh, after talking to developers about all of this, uh, maybe we should be working with developers in some uh, way. Developers are more and more aware that they are having a lot of data, and they are more and more concerned about what is done with that data. Probably in the context of things like Facebook or whatever, they are starting to get concerned about, well, they have me good professional history in it. Maybe I don't want that history to be public in such and such way. Or maybe that's going to be a problem for me with the next employer or stuff like that. So maybe we need to start working with them, learning what they want to do, oh, sorry, what they want us to do with the data and what they don't want us to do with the data. Uh, uh, looking at the internet, I saw this idea, which is from a point of view quite interesting. This is an idea of taking the, the, the same simplification of Creative Commons to licenses, but the permissions on data. And the idea is to have simple categories that anybody can understand, and you, or you can say, for my data, I want people to do this and this, but not this and this. So have a look at it, because it's, um, for a good it's a very clever idea. And it's basically the three, four, six things that you may be worried about, just saying, well, I don't mind if I use this this way, I want to work. So for instance, this is, I don't mind if, uh, this is for websites, I don't mind if the site I use my data, but I don't want it to be served with others. Uh, I don't mind if they are using the data uh, for three years or for decision or for uh, my whole life, whatever. And in the end, uh, there is also sorry, there is also an IEEE working group uh, doing something quite similar, which is a specified machine readable data, basically for the same thing. And uh, in the end, the idea is maybe we should be working with the developers so that they write in the repository something like a, a license for data on what they want people to do with the data. And uh, I'm starting to talk to some developers of this. If you are interested in joining, let, let me know. Because the idea would be to find a way of uh, being respectful with the developers. But because my impression is, if that's not happening during the next few years, at some point, developers are, some developers at least, are not going to start to see universities because of the data we publish. And look at the papers we are promising. In many cases, the data set with the papers could really be a problem for some specific persons. Especially when they are switching jobs or when they are working for competing companies or when collaborating with a company while working for another, for instance. And that things that happen in the virtual world already. And that's it. 
So if you want to have a look in more detail, uh, for me, this was the, the most interesting document. It's for preparing grants proposals for the 820 um, um, codes, but still details most of the stuff that we need to know. This is the TDPR portal, where we have everything including the law itself. And this is also quite interesting. This is quite short, four pages. And it's basically an impact of GDPR in research for UK people, UK researchers. But I think it's applicable for most of the world. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for being two minutes late. Thank you.
Um, I think that we need to find, or somebody needs to, needs to find the balance. But yeah, I think that's why I said the data is not the, I mean, the, the regulations are not designed for public data, and the regulations are not designed for publishing data either, which means uh, that's a problem. And, and we have not been talking about the interaction with things like the, the right to be forgotten, for instance, which is even worse, because that means that they could be asking to be completely removed from their records. It's not clear to which extent that would apply to, to research data, for instance, and probably not. But still, maybe some court at some point can rule out that you need to remove these lines from these people because they asked. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And the other, uh, the other remote, uh, I had also in the beginning, uh, if you want to mention it yourself as well. So even so, you can do, okay, if you do anonymization and everything is okay because it's freely anonymous. If you do pseudo anonymization and you can do whatever effort you want to, to pseudo anonymize. Uh, the, you will always, with sufficient uh, sufficient amount of effort, be able to uh, de-anonymize. Exactly. And, and what is more, as somebody pointed out, if you are using public data, they can always reproduce exactly what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which, which means that it can be done exactly the same thing. And, I mean, and that's where you need to find a residual balance. That doesn't make sense to hide something that can be obtained by just running a script in uh, two minutes or something. I mean, even if your data is not I mean, if your data is completely anonymized, that you drop any uh, name of whatever kind, and you cannot, you don't have public data. You typically know uh, things about distributions. In case of gender, you know that we are in the male-dominated field, right? So if you intersect a couple of those things, like age, gender, or whatever, <coughs> which each one of them on its own is not necessarily problematic, but once you take an intersection, you are just done. Was it narrows down your Google <coughs> suspects to one single person. Which means that in some cases maybe you should be <coughs> storing even the, the list of repositories, for instance. Yes. Which from the research point of view doesn't make sense because it's going to render it completely repository. Right. Yeah. Like, I thought so, okay, was, uh, before giving your presentation, I thought, okay, if we do proper type of animation with lots of sophisticated algorithms, mm -hmm. we are pretty safe. But then I ran across some papers in which they said, okay, well, you can do this and you think you're safe, but then we just use other, yet another data source. We are looking into the source code of this data, stylometry, <coughs> and then we can still mm -hmm. retrieve the identity by just right. comparing similar pieces of code. And we know if in some piece of code where it is public. But, but, but that's where I also said that depending on what you are finding, that can be important or not, because if, if the results of your paper can be reproduced much more easily in some other way, it really doesn't matter. Because in some cases, they think the kind of things that we do, as you said, for instance, you can just write a script and get the same data set. In that case, it doesn't make sense to try to avoid the telemetry, for instance, because you can just run and run the scripts. In some other cases, depending on your findings, maybe it's important, because maybe you can single out three persons with some specific profile from, I don't know, five million persons. And, and, and that may be relevant for these two persons. Okay. Thank you very much.